Um, I'm Katie Crawford Lackey. I'm Montpelier's public historian. And this is a relatively new series. It's actually the second one. Um, it's called Legacies of the Constitution, which is a series that examines the impact the US Constitution has on those living in the United States, past, present, and future. And America's founding principles were established and upheld by white men of privilege. And the Constitution has at times been used to exclude those who do not fit that description. But beginning in the 19th century, interpretation of the Constitution began to expand to acknowledge the rights and privileges of those originally denied inclusion, due largely to their efforts themselves. So this series is really designed to explore how those denied equal treatment have challenged the structural discrimination and oppression. Um, and we're very pleased to have Ella Wagner speaking with us this evening. Um, she's a public historian specializing in the race and gender history of temperance and prohibition. She is currently a fellow with the Cultural Resources Office of Interpretation and Education at the National Park Service and will complete her PhD from Loyola University Chicago in the summer of 2022. She curated an award-winning digital exhibit, Truth Telling, Francis Willard and Ida B. Wells for the Francis Willard House Museum in Evanston, Illinois in 2019. And Ella is actually, she's graduating this summer, but she has just finished her dissertation and submitting it this week. So all of this temperance information is very fresh in her mind. So um, I'm happy that she's here to talk a little bit about her research today. Um, and so tonight, uh, she'll be discussing the complexities of the women's temperance movement and how it defined the legal landscape. So groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union, for example, sought to present the negative impact of alcohol on society and called for the passage of a constitutional amendment. And this ratification of the 18th Amendment prohibited the sale and transportation of alcohol, but it was very difficult to enforce. So it was passed in 1919, but public sentiment turned against prohibition by the late 1920s. And so throughout this debate over prohibition, Americans questioned how to balance personal liberty with social well-being. So temperance groups argued that alcohol abuse led to domestic violence, which really endangered women in particular. And, you know, Kind of in opposition, many immigrant groups oppose prohibition, defending their own drinking customs and pointing out when supporters use nativist and anti-Catholic rhetoric. Then among Black Americans, the debate was particularly complex. So some Black leaders supported repeal, noting that enforcement officers targeted Black people more often than white people. However, other leaders warned that repeal of the 18th Amendment could set a concerning legal precedent, potentially jeopardizing the Reconstruction Amendments, so the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and Black Americans' rights. Um, so this evening, um, Ella will kind of be elaborating on these different topics within like the parameters of temperance itself. And so before we kind of dive in, can you, Ella, give us a little bit of background on the temperance movement? So groups involved, what they were advocating for and why? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, so thanks once again to Montpelier for having me. Um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, have a chance to talk to you about the temperance movement, which I think is one of the most kind of underestimated, interesting, um, historical events and movements that we that we have to, to investigate. So I wanted to give a little bit of background about prohibition. Um, as Katie just said, uh, when you think about temperance and prohibition, and I'll kind of get to the distinction between those two in a minute, um, most people bring to mind kind of the, the stereotype of the years of national prohibition. So when the amendment was enforced between 1919 and 1933, um, and the amendment banned the sale and manufacture and transportation of alcohol, but didn't actually ban drinking itself. And um, it's also the, the only, so far, the only constitutional amendment to be repealed, um, which is a really interesting story of how that came to happen. And, um, and so when we think about prohibition, often the, the popular image is sort of uh, the roaring 20s, like gangsters, flappers, speakeasies. Uh, and if we think about prohibitionists at all, there's often this image of kind of this like dour older woman who like really just hates fun and doesn't want anyone to have a good time. And I think, you know, it's not that it's not that there's no truth to those stereotypes. And certainly there's a lot of interesting research about um, urban leisure culture and all the changes that, that took place like during prohibition. 
Um, but I, it's actually a lot more complicated and interesting than those stereotypes would suggest. And I think that uh, delving a little more deeply can really teach us a lot about a lot of debates that we're, that we're having in our own time um, that might not immediately seem to be connected, but really are. Uh, and personally, I think, you know, as historians, we often kind of look for movements and um, events that kind of foreshadow or lead to like the causes that we care about now. Um, but it can be just as interesting and instructive to look at, to try to understand like the perspectives of people in the past who we really uh, like don't get why they thought the way that they thought. And this was really my hook into the temperance movement was wanting to understand like how so many people for so long really felt that getting people to stop drinking alcohol and or using the state to start restricting alcohol would solve all kinds of social problems. Um, because I think that's, you know, for good reasons, really alien perspective to the way that we think about it today. Um, so hopefully what I'll do tonight is kind of try to bring you along uh, with me to my, to my interest in this topic. Um, so just as like a little bit more background about temperance and prohibition, um, the distinction first between them. So I'll, I may use the terms kind of interchangeably, but they are different in important ways. Um, the temperance movement was the effort to persuade people not to drink alcohol. So to you know, convince them uh, to provide education, but to generally get people to, to give it up themselves. Um, and prohibition is the, the use of laws and, and restrictions to prohibit like, or restrict like when people can drink the, the manufacture of alcohol, et cetera. So really like a, a campaign of education and persuasion versus legal restriction. And often like these two methods went together and many temperance groups felt that they were both necessary um, to, to kind of end the, the, the social consequences that they saw, the problems that they saw being caused by alcohol, but they are a little bit different. Um, so in general, temperance, the temperance movement, one of the longest and kind of broadest social movements in US history, um, but because it really withered away and died after the repeal of the 18th Amendment, we don't think about it a lot. Um, and I think what's sort of important to note at the outset is like, it meant different things to different people at different times. Um, and there are a lot of different arguments and perspectives used in service of this shared goal of like getting people to stop drinking. Um, but, and I think the other, you know, the reason for that is, is interesting and true, which is that like alcohol is uh, a material substance. It kind of has this, this dual identity. It's a, a beverage that if you drink it, it will change your brain chemistry and get you drunk and like possibly cause some problems to your health and maybe make you feel good. And it's also at the same time, a really powerful, like symbolic substance. It has cultural meaning. It has religious meaning. It has meaning within family relationships. Um, and those are different depending on kind of your perspective. So the Tempers movement really started in the early 1800s. Um, and initially temperance meant um, moderate drinking or like avoiding liquor uh, or avoiding getting drunk. And it was really common um, among evangelical Protestants. So denominations that today we would call mainline. So a lot of Methodists, Baptists supported temperance, the temperance movement. Um, and it was also connected to uh, other social reform causes before the civil war, including abolitionism and women's rights. Um, the Civil War, for kind of obvious reasons, sort of put a pause on, on temperance activism, um, but it resurged after the Civil War, and uh, a number of new groups kind of sprung up to make kind of new, new like arguments for why it was important. And the other thing that happened kind of during this time period is that temperance went from meaning moderate drinking or avoiding liquor to meaning complete abstinence from alcohol entirely. Um, and so one of these new groups is called the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is the organization that I study. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of their particular lens on it in a minute. Um, but these groups, um, the WCTU and the Prohibition Party, they really uh, made kind of uneven progress, both in kind of getting people to be interested in temperance and giving up drinking and also in persuading uh, states and and towns to adopt various restrictions on alcohol use. Um, and really the, the tide for prohibition kind of turned in the early 20th century um, when a new organization called the Anti-Saloon League formed to push for um, like a pretty narrow like political 
solution to prohibition. And they focused on getting representatives elected who were going to vote for the laws that they wanted passed. And they mostly cared about, are you going to vote for prohibition? Great, we'll vote for you. If not, forget about it. Um, and they really succeeded in building momentum. Um, states increasingly passed prohibition laws, and eventually uh, they launched a campaign for a constitutional amendment uh, in 1913 that succeeded much faster than they expected, partly due to other influences like World War I. Uh, and uh, the 18th Amendment was ratified in 1919. So that's sort of your brief crash course history of the temperance movement. And can you describe, I know you touched on it just a little bit, but who, what groups are for temperance and prohibition and why and, and who's against it? Yeah, and this is one of the most interesting aspects of this, this research kind of, as I said before, that there are really different groups of people at different times for different reasons, supporting prohibition or opposing it. Um, and we can make kind of some general statements about who these people were and why. So like I said, uh, evangelical Christianity, Protestantism in particular, was really like a, a locus of this reform. Um, and it was linked to religious ideas about the purity of the body, um, about having control over one's appetites, and like really linked drinking and kind of the disorder that it could cause with sin. So that's definitely one, one connection that's really important. Um, women. So particularly after the Civil War, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, was formed to argue for temperance kind of from a, a women's perspective specifically. And they were really successful kind of in, in putting forward this new argument for temperance based on uh, the harms to women from uh, drunk men, basically. So they, they pointed out that this is, a, this is an era when women had very few rights. Um, if it was hard to get a divorce from your husband, um, it was hard to get custody of your children. Uh, in many states, if you were married through a married woman, if you, even if you had your own job, you made your own money, your wages actually belonged to your husband. Um, and obviously, uh, this is before women's suffrage, so no voting rights. And uh, the WCT pointed out that if uh, a woman's husband you know, went to work and then went to the saloon afterward and spent all his money at the saloon and then came home drunk and potentially, you know, abused her or her children that she had like very little recourse. And they really framed uh, temperance as this problem that uniquely affected women and that they were uniquely qualified to speak on kind of as an extension of addressing uh, issues going on in, in the women's sphere of the home. So that, that argument became very powerful and the link kind of between women's reform and temperance was really strong for, for decades. And the WCTU also kind of used their arguments to, to make a push eventually for women's suffrage, um, arguing that if women were really gonna be able to take these reforms that they needed to see and make them permanent, they needed the ballot as well as kind of this moral authority. Um, African-Americans, so the relationship between African-American communities and temperance uh, is complicated, but during the 1800s, um, there's some really interesting, so as I said before the Civil War, temperance as a reform was linked to abolitionism. And Black temperance reformers, both before and after the Civil War, often described it in really interesting terms as another type of enslavement. And then they meant a few different things by that. Um, it's not always the same, but uh, just like, for example, Frederick Douglass, who's the well-known abolitionist and, and reformer and women suffragist, um, was also a staunch temperance advocate. And the way he talked about it was like, he described alcohol as having been used by enslavers to basically prevent enslaved people from resisting. Um, and he said the most alcohol was, quote, the most effective means in the hands of the slaveholder in keeping down the spirit of insurrection. Um, and this was kind of carried forward by a lot of middle class black women after the Civil War who were involved in, in various reform activities. Um, and who kind of advocated for temperance as part of um, claiming like dignity and respectability and, and challenging racist stereotypes um, of black men and women uh, after the Civil War. Um, I can go on there a few more, but uh, in the early 20th century, um, temperance reformers started to use the language of 
uh, progressivism. So, uh, you know, other reformers who were attacking monopolies, who were who were demanding um, kind of an end to corporate greed, kind of as we talk about it today. Uh, they also turned this language on alcohol manufacturers, and they described it sort of similarly to how the campaign against big tobacco went, you know, <laughs> a few decades ago, saying like, this industry is out here to sell you poison and convince you that it's fine and making money off the suffering that it's causing. And that was an effective, an effective um, argument as well. And then I guess finally, in terms of supporters, um, there are, there's also a lot of uh, temperance activism that's linked to racism and nativism um, that there, and this is a imp really important aspect to understand that there are many dry reformer and I sort of say dry, that was the, the shorthand for meaning don't drink, um, that, that really used uh, the, that temperance and prohibition kind of as a cover to, to attack African-Americans and immigrants and to advance negative stereotypes about these groups and to try to um, restrict like their, their leisure, their, their cultural activities. And that's another really important part of the story. Um, so in terms of opponents, uh, lots of, lots of people throughout this whole, this whole, uh, story, um, in general, the, the two major parties, so both Democrats and Republicans really up until it was clear that, that the amendment was on the verge of passing, um, neither party was like particularly supportive of temperance Republicans slightly more, but always kind of uneasily. So, um, because it was, it was not clear that there was a constituency, um, that would, you know, get them elected if they took such a strong stand about it. Um, a lot of men, not all men, certainly, but um, many men, uh, particularly when temperance became linked kind of with women's activism, um, treated it as, as uh, an object of ridicule and women speaking in public as an object of ridicule. Um, many immigrant groups, um, particularly from Europe, um, were, were a, a center of opposition to temperance and they really defined it as, um, for good reasons, as we've just said, uh, as an attack on their, their cultural practices um, and their, as an attempt to force them to assimilate into you know, a certain way of life that they were not interested in. Um, and they defended you know, their, own, their own drinking and their own uh, cultural identity as, as immigrants in the United States. Um, and then generally people who felt that drinking behavior and I think this is this is what probably what most of us would opinion would share about this today. That drinking behavior was not the government's business or reformers' business, but that it was really your decision whether to drink or not drink, and not a matter for the state to be involved in. Um, and during the years of national prohibition, which saw a real increase in organized crime and law breaking of all kinds, um, there the backlash to to using the state to to implement this reform became a lot stronger and there were a lot more people who fell into the opposing camp until eventually uh, repeal happened. And I think the 18th amendment is just a really interesting subject to study because as you mentioned, it's the only amendment to be repealed. So can you talk about, I mean, obviously you mentioned there's a lot of social support for this, especially on behalf of women's groups, um, but can you speak to how this kind of became an amendment. And then obviously it lost support because it was repealed. So can you speak about that process a bit? Yes, definitely. So the, the process of getting the 18th Amendment passed is really interesting and sort of like historically contingent. Um, a lot of things had to go right for it to happen. Um, and like we've sort of said, it, it quickly became clear that there was not like a broad social consensus in favor of it. Um, although it, there were enough people like who supported it at the time that it was passed to get it passed. But um, so I, as I said, the, the Anti-Saloon League, which was a relatively new organization in the early 20th century, um, was a main, certainly not the, the only or most important group in this movement, but really important in getting the amendment passed. And that was because they pioneered and implemented what we would call today kind of modern pressure politics. Um, so they were a single issue organization um, their line was like, if, if, and there are other organizations like this, I'm sure you can think of a few, um, you know, in our, in our politics today, but if you were going to, if men, basically, if you were going to run for elected office and you agreed to support prohibition, whatever prohibition law the ASL wanted, 
um, they would use their influence and their money to try to get you elected. And then if you went back on that promise, um, they would do whatever they possibly could to get you kicked out of office. And um, they, they avoided kind of getting involved in other issues that were linked to temperance. So the WC2 was a much broader organization. They cared about suffrage. They cared about prison reform. They cared about an end to prostitution, um, about evangelization. They had a broad range of interests that they advanced at the same time. And the ASL was like, you know, you don't even have to be personally temperate. Like if you are a politician, we don't care if you drink or don't drink as long as you vote the way we want you to vote. Um, and this was successful. Like they managed to get a lot of states to pass prohibition laws in part by using these tactics. Um, and this kind of set up Congress to, to have enough support to get the amendment ratified. Um, a few other, I won't go too far into this, but um, the atmosphere of World War I really kind of accelerated the process in part due to uh, nativism against Germans um, who were involved uh, disproportionately in the brewing industry. And um, when the US entered the war, this kind of became like another you know, nativist kind of front in this general like patriotic fervor um, pushing for, for wartime prohibition, which preceded the amendment. Um, then once the amendment was passed, however, there were a few things that hobbled it other than I think um, the general like uh, how different it was from previous from previous constitutional amendments in terms of regulating people's, you know, what many people felt was private behavior. Um, there was not enough money appropriated for enforcement and the act that enforced the law had a lot of loopholes. So um, effectively it created a system where it was very easy to bribe the officials who were supposed to be enforcing prohibition. Um, if you were poor, uh, working class, and often if you were an immigrant or African-American, you were likely to be disproportionately targeted by what enforcement did happen. So there were more often raids on like illegal saloons um, that were run by immigrants or African-Americans or that were in these neighborhoods in cities. But if you were rich, um, you were allowed to keep your wine cellar. You People stocked up a wine cellar and had parties in their private home and just basically rode it out and they were fine. And that created a lot of resentment at how differently the law was applied um, based on you know, a person's wealth or social status or access to like a wine cellar, literally. Um, so. Uh, basically, in general, even some prohibition leaders were concerned that the amendment had succeeded too fast. And there were some who felt that, you know, get the law in and then people will learn, people will respect the law and they'll learn that like this is the right reform. Um, and that didn't happen. And there were some leaders who warned that the country probably wasn't ready for a prohibition amendment and that really, uh, you know, a longer term education campaign would have been more successful in sort of convincing people that this reform was, was just and was good. Um, and I think probably that would not have been true for many reasons, but it certainly was true that um, the amendment crumbled when it became clear that there was not a kind of durable consensus for, for keeping it in place. And I wanna touch on something that you brought up earlier. So we're talking about you know, a lot of people thinking that drinking is a private behavior, you know, questions about is this really the government's business to be regulating? And I know, you know, you and I before this call have had a lot of conversations about like freedom and, and how it's defined within the parameters of this constitutional amendment. So can you speak a little bit about how the rhetoric of freedom is coming up in regard to the 18th amendment? Yeah, so this is really interesting. And this is something, this, this concept of freedom, which you know Americans have always loved to talk about and what freedom is and what it means was very much always like baked into the debates about prohibition. And it really comes down to kind of a diff, you know, what is your definition of, of what it means to be free? So um, the people who opposed temperance and prohibition often would, would, you know, personal liberty was the slogan. And particularly in immigrant groups, they were very much, you know, this is like, this is supposed to be America. You guys are obsessed, obsessed with your freedom. Like why would the, you know, this is, this is contrary to the values that you say that you support. Um, and that would mean, you know, it's your choice to drink if you choose to drink. Um, it's your body 
uh, it's your home, like your private space, um, and I think particularly like your family uh, to decide decision and your culture's decision to decide whether or not to imbibe. And um, that's obviously like the side that we've mostly come down on as a society, like for extremely good reasons. Um, but the temperance reformers would argue that, you know, really freedom, some aspect of freedom is having protection from forces that are bigger than you, more powerful than you, um, and that could cause, you know, social or individual harm. And they may have defined those forces differently at different times. So um, the progressive sort of strand would have said, you know, hey, like this, the, the liquor traffic, the liquor manufacturers are a big business, they're trying to make money, uh, and they don't care who they hurt or what families they destroy along the way. And they don't care that that alcohol is basically poison. Um, and then the WCTU would say, like, is this, we need to protect women, you know, freedom for women would mean freedom from uh, having a drunken husband who could basically ruin their lives. Uh, and from a kind of religious perspective, it would be more about having freedom from sin and temptation, um, having freedom from what they would describe as appetites that like took over your body and that were, you know, taking over like your mind and your reason and your soul. Um, so, you know, those, those kind of really, when you, again, as I said at the beginning, really drew me to this topic because they are a really different way of thinking about um, how we decide like what is appropriate for the state or society to regulate and how we decide what should be an individual's personal decision. And the boundary between, you know, when your decision just affects you and when it affects other people is not always clear. Um, and I think that was something that the, the temperance movement was really exploring. Uh, and that certainly is still an issue for us now in 2022. And can you talk about what the conversation around repeal looked like and you know who had the most to lose? And I mean, particularly given that an amendment up till this point had never been repealed before. So what are the implications for that? What, what implications did this have for all constitutional amendments? Yeah, so this is a really interesting, a really interesting aspect of this. So the debate around repeal, um, the context that it's happening, it was clear by the late 20s that uh, there were major problems with prohibition, that enforcement was not working, that there were lots of other unintended harms crime and violence that were coming out of, of this, the problems with enforcement. Um, and you know the country also had bigger problems, um, particularly after October 1929, when uh, we entered the Great Depression, where like prohibition just seemed, you know, the government needed tax revenue uh, and prohibition kind of descended as, a, as an important concern. Um, but that didn't mean that there weren't good reasons to be cautious about repealing the amendment. And in fact, um, there's research by a historian named Lisa Matterson um, who looks at black women temperance advocates uh, in the 1920s who, who opposed the repeal of prohibition. They have been longtime temperance supporters and they you know, made the case that uh, the, the precedent for overturning, for repealing a constitutional amendment was, could be extremely dangerous for black Americans' rights. Um, that they basically, you know, reviewed all the arguments for repealing prohibition, that it was a law that wasn't working, it was a law that was being widely ignored, um, and it was a law that, like, a large segment of society didn't support and didn't want, and they said, well, you know what, like, let's think about the 14th Amendment, let's think about the 15th Amendment, this is a time where Jim Crow laws are in force across the South that are effectively nullifying these amendments. There are poll taxes and grandfather clauses and just violence and intimidation that are keeping Black Americans from their constitutional right to vote. And that so white Southern leaders uh, were very vocal about saying, these amendments were forced on us by the government and we don't want them, we don't support them. Um, and so this is a really I mean, they, these women um, were not obviously successful in, in stopping repeal from, from happening, but uh, they, they were not misguided to have these concerns. I mean, this was actually something that some supporters of prohibition repeal, like people who wanted to get rid of the amendment were saying like, well, we've already seen what happens when 
society doesn't support any particular law. Um, so this is this should be the case here as well. We've already seen how the white South has has reject, effectively rejected reconstruction amendments. Um, and so I think that that was, I found a really fascinating dynamic um, that I had not expected uh, until I read this particular research. Um, and it is a good reminder that, you know, we have, we can have a lot of debates about um, minority rights and about what the, the sanctity of the law means, what it means to respect the law, um, but, Ultimately, those those conversations have to be rooted in our values as a society, which in the past were not always what we might hope they would have been. Um, so yeah, a really fascinating dynamic um, to that part of the story. And I wanna ask you um, in just a minute, a little bit more about kind of the regulation of substances, but just curious if the 21st amendment was supported. So the repeal, was there support around that when it was passed? Uh, yeah, in general, yeah. I mean, people were people were happy to see um, it. You know, not everyone. Obviously, the the WCTU, which still exists, also um, was very unhappy. And you know, actually, um, if you live in a state like I do in Maryland, where uh, there are restrictions on, for example, buying alcohol in the grocery store, um, it's most likely that those date to the period immediately after repeal, um, when some states. Uh, reacted to having to having national prohibition repealed by passing their own um, their own laws regulating the sale of alcohol. Um, that's and you know there are some states like Pennsylvania where like the, the state is actually involved in sale. That's usually from like the post prohibition period. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think one thing that kind of gets lost again from kind of this frame of like prohibition was a minority you know extremist minority view that everyone knew was crazy. And then we tried it and it failed and we all knew how, now we all know how crazy it was. It kind of um, overlooks like some of the uh, conversations around repeal. So uh, FDR was the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president who signed repeal when he, when he made statements like rolling back alcohol regulations. He said, you know, I think we're all, we're all looking forward to a return, you know, of this, this choice of personal liberty, but neither do we want to see um, disorderly rowdy saloons um, that are engendering like violence and bar fights like we don't want to see those return in our society either so I recommend you know I ask all Americans to basically like please drink responsibly um, and so there was a very much like still a sense that that prohibition while failed in the objectives that it had sought um, was a response to a real social problem that did exist um, and in general, like the temperance movement tracked with uh, real increases in drinking behavior. So when it first became popular in the early 1800s, um, that was due, it correlates with uh, like a large upsurge in how much people were drinking. And that's kind of been the case ever since where um, when restrictions are higher, people drink less. And then the need for the restrictions seems to have disappeared and people wonder why they can't um, make their own leisure decisions. And then when restrictions go down, um, drinking goes up and the resultant harms from alcohol go up. And um, people end up kind of asking the same question again of like, how do we balance the, the you know, personal liberty that we wanna see with wider social harms? Yes, and that's actually kind of leading into my next question about you know, there is a balance between personal liberty versus social well-being. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned at the beginning, Ella, that's something that we still struggle with as a society today. So I know that you talked about some other examples of this. Um, you know, obviously, we don't regulate alcohol in that way anymore, um, but we do regulate other substances. So I'm just wondering if you can kind of shed some light on, on that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure that you all can think of a lot of parallels to present concerns, like based on the things that I've said. Um, we, I mean, states, as I said, like do, we do still have some regulations on alcohol, um, age regulations and uh, driving regulations in particular. And we also have kind of social, um, social and medical recommendations and restrictions that have been really enforced over the last few decades, like um, not drinking when you're pregnant, for example. And again, those are, those have both a basis in reality and are kind of a result of 
society is trying to think about how to balance um, harm and, and liberty. Um, I think a really, you know, a really interesting parallel is, is definitely the, the anti-smoking campaign um, in that it's sort of used a lot of the language with less of the religious emphasis, but a lot of the same language around kind of the progressive strain um, of arguments for temperance to attack the tobacco industry um, and to say, again, you know, this, this lobby and this, these companies are here to sell you a product that will kill you and <laughs> they're lying to you about it. Um, and then also like the balance has slowly tipped towards against people's right to, for example, smoke in a restaurant. Um, because we've decided that the harm from secondhand smoke and also like the inconvenience um, to those who choose not to smoke, that the, the boundary is, is, has moved. Um, and that certainly was controversial at the time that it happened. Um, but I think we seem to have passed over that threshold um, and kind of decided a little, a little more clearly like where the line is um, with regard to smoking. Um, and I think that, you know, a, an interesting and the, the campaigns against uh, narcotics are a real, like whole other can of worms that we don't have time to get into here, but um, other interesting parallels are, are definitely to the critiques of the war on drugs as being um, racist and as having, has having racist uh, impacts and that they, they've disproportionately uh, harsher penalties for, for drug violations have disproportionately incarcerated um, men of color, particularly Latino and black men. And those, and that the, the language and the conversation around um, the use of the state to kind of, to regulate substance use, um, that has also had, had consequences similar to what happened during prohibition. Um, I think, and I, I guess I can sort of conclude by saying that I was surprised in kind of researching where we stand as a society with alcohol mortality by how high it is. Um, we, we sort of accept as a matter of course, like almost 100,000 alcohol related deaths per year. And uh, that number has been creeping up um, slowly over the last two decades and then spiked dramatically um, by 25% during the first year of the pandemic in 2020. Um, and it's interesting I think to me that, that I think in some ways our, our conversation about alcohol is sort of stuck in a lot of assumptions that we have about prohibition and what happens when you try to do anything to regulate alcohol um, and that it could be a good time and hopefully these, these new statistics will provoke a little more conversation about um, what we could be doing to try to bring that harm, that number of deaths down while still respecting the, the cultural and, and and entertainment and, and all the other reasons that people value being able to drink and value being able to make that choice. So I would be interested to hear what thoughts others have, um, but those are just a few off the top of my head. Yeah, thank you, Ella. That's, um, I think, really enlightening just to think about the connection to today and, and what's happening in terms of alcohol use in 2022. Um, and I invite folks to put questions in the chat for Ella. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting, Ella, you did a really great job of connecting kind of these intersections between, you know, gender, class, race, kind of ethnic identity. Um, there's so much socially going on. I mean, because I think when you think of temperance and prohibition, at least for me, I think about it very much in the legal aspect, but you don't, at least I didn't quite understand everything socially that was happening from all these different perspectives. So it sounds very dynamic. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Um, so we have a question from Mark Shields. One theme that runs strongly through American history to this day is the divide between rural and urban areas. Mm -hmm. What impact did this have on the support for the 18th and 21st amendments? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think, um, so generally speaking, um, rural areas were more supportive of temperance than urban areas. And this, this does have to do with um, the populations that we were talking about before, of like who is most likely to support versus oppose temperance. Um, urban areas uh, were more likely to have many more immigrants and to have um, more neighborhoods where a lot of people uh, from the same European country who had immigrated lived together and kind of created their own 
um, their own communities and often their own organizations that might focus among, among other things on opposing temperance. Um, and there's a really, but there were certainly also temperance reformers who were urban. And there are many people who lived in suburban areas, um, lived near to cities. Uh, it's not only like farmers and, and people living out in really rural areas who were interested and supportive of temperance. Um, but it's it kind of does get to um, a theme of, of the progressive era, which is about kind of the problems with the city. And this is sort of a classic uh, focus of reformers in the progressive era that uh, the city was something that needed to be cleaned up. And in many ways that was actually true in terms of sanitation, um, and in terms of housing, there were like major problems um, going on in, in urban areas, but the reforms of the progressive era were also kind of linked to um, concern uh, among native born Americans about uh, new immigrants, about um, new kind of forms of, of leisure and socializing happening in like bars and, um, and about sexual behavior. Um, so yeah, it's, there's certainly, it's not quite as dark as um, maybe it would seem to be, but the the kind of image of the city as a place of kind of disorder and um, a place where where problematic drinking is happening um, definitely is important to this conversation. Yeah, that's a good point, Ella. Do you think kind of that I feel like today in today's society, we have this maybe romanticized vision of the 1920s and the flappers and the parties and the great Gatsby, you know, mm -hmm. scene. Is that, I mean, I mean, and it sounds a little bit like obviously the rich kind of had the advantage here in terms of having their own wine cellars, but is that an accurate depiction of what was happening or is it, I'm guessing it's some more complex than that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, that's that stuff certainly was happening and I mean this is not so as much my area of research but there is really good history about the transformation in like nightlife and leisure culture that was happening in big cities like during this time period um and I think in some ways it's like the image of it is is larger than the like number of people who were really participating in this but um some of the really important developments and this is also these are also cultural changes that contributed to kind of eroding support for prohibition is that um increasingly in big cities you had um young people particularly young women who are living on their own um maybe in an apartment with a roommate um or in like a boarding house and working and then going out and spending their money uh, in new kind of venues where like mixed gender drinking was happening and where men and women could socialize outside of home or work or like the supervision of their family. And that was a really big change. Um, this is, you know, the, the kind of older model. Um, a lot of these young women would have come from maybe from rural areas, from smaller towns where had they remained there, they would have had a lot less um, like personal liberty to go and, and a, a lot fewer leisure choices. And those new opportunities and then the new the new types of um, dress and behavior and uh, and opportunities to socialize, like particularly for women that arrived like during the prohibition years, really made it kind of undermine this image that was older um, about like drinking being a primarily male problem that was happening in male spaces that was then being brought home to women. Um, because in a lot of these cases now, like women were out with men and kind of taking the edge off of this maybe rowdier uh, culture um, and, and making their own decisions about, about like moderate drinking. Um, so that is certainly a really important part of this too, that um, there were enough culture changes that um, these, these older images and these older kind of indications of what was bad about drinking didn't seem so important or so kind of uh, immediate anymore. And throughout kind of this conversation, you've been talking about kind of these groups, you know, who have been advocating or, you know, in support of temperance. Um, but in your bio, uh, Francis Willard is referenced because you were at the Francis Willard House Museum. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about kind of her, who she is within this movement, um, as well as kind of this uh, project you worked on, this digital exhibit, Truth Telling, Francis Willard and Ida B. Wells, and maybe a little bit about Willard and Wells and kind of you know, what that relationship looked like. Sure. So 
yeah, I've, I've focused less on the WCTU, um, just in the interest of kind of doing a bigger overview of temperance and prohibition. Um, but my research and my previous work has really focused on this women's organization. Um, and Frances Willard was the uh, president, sort of the most famous president and the president during the most influential time of the WCTU, which is from like the 18, mid 1880s uh, until she died in the late 1890s. And um, she was extremely famous during her life. Um, she's not very well known now. She actually, uh, the first statue of a woman to be in Statuary Hall in the Capitol is of Frances Willard. Um, and yeah, she was, she was extremely famous and has not, I think partly because temperance is not, um, uh, perhaps like the later, we don't tend to see it as like, oh, a heroine of the past, um, but she was also a suffragist. And, and she is important for a lot of reasons, but um, really was the person who articulated this argument that the WCTU made linking kind of this idea that women had appropriate like moral authority over the home and family that was being threatened by drinking and by male drinking and by the, the um, neglect of like the government or broader society to do anything about it. And the way that she put it, it meant that women should take, you know, women have the authority and, and in fact, like should step out uh, beyond, you know, maybe roles that they had been accustomed to take on to the past. And they should um, organize politically and seek the vote and um, convert people to temperance and, you know, form this, this political organization and participate in politics. And this was really successful, as I said, um, kind of in recruiting women to this organization in making this case for temperance that like made sense in the context of values of gender um, and domesticity. Um, but she, and she was like, I said, it really influential and, and really well acquainted with a lot of other reform leaders at the time, suffragists, people like Frederick Douglass, people like Susan B. Anthony. Um, but that didn't mean that uh, she didn't also come into conflict with some of these people at certain times. And um, so just as some context, her, her home uh, is a museum. It's in Evanston, Illinois, just outside Chicago. And uh, earlier in my grad school time there, I worked on an exhibit for the museum um, that was about this conflict between Frances Willard and Ida B. Wells, who many of you have probably heard of. She was an extremely important um, black journalist and suffragist and anti-lynching advocate uh, who at like great personal risk drew attention to um, the crisis of lynching and racist violence in the South and the various like myths that were used to, um, to justify and excuse mob, white mob violence against um, particularly black men, but also black women, um, which included this, this lie that black men were frequently raping white women, which was just not true. Um, and she really, she really drew attention to this and like pushed for, um, for this to be acknowledged. Uh, and uh, she and Willard came into conflict because Willard basically repeated this rhetoric, um, of, you know, portraying black men as a threat to white women and portraying um, alcohol as kind of this essential ingredient of this, this supposed threat. Um, and she did that even though there were black women who were members of the WCTU who were leaders in the WCTU. Um, and so Ida B. Wells uh, challenged her and um, Frances Fuller did not react particularly well, it was very defensive. And it kind of went on um, in, this, in this conflict for months uh, until eventually um, Willard like sort of, but not really apologized. Um, her apology would not get good marks from, from I think our, our evaluation of apologies in 2022. Um, but so uh, the, the museum wanted to explore this, this conflict, um, which was something that is really important to her legacy. And that really kind of gets to a lot of the, the um, racism and racial tension that were part of the suffrage and temperance movements. Um, so if you are interested in, in exploring that more, um, the exhibit is online, maybe Katie can, can get the link in or we'll, we can send it afterward. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just is sort of another way of revealing how um, these movements were interconnected and really, and really 
connected to a lot of other important stories and important developments that are going on in, in American society at this time. Thank you. Yeah, that's, um, I think the individual kind of leaders within these movements are, are really fascinating to focus on. And obviously, I know we're doing more of a general um, view this evening, but I appreciate you kind of, you know, explaining just the dynamics. I mean, it was a very dynamic movement, obviously. Um, and I'm wondering if you mind sharing the most interesting thing about your research, like one thing you, you think folks should take away about the temperance movement. Okay, so um, I, okay, as I just explained, um, the WCTU was very good at using this argument about um, like drunkard husbands being a threat to their families. And one question that I had when I was starting out with the research is, was like, how many women joined this organization because their husband was a drunkard? Um, and I sort of sensed and other scholars who had written about this kind of agreed that there's probably no way to know for sure um, because uh, this would not have been something that people often talked about in public. Um, it would have been considered like overstepping the bounds of, you know, if your son was maybe struggling with alcohol use, overstepping the bounds of family privacy and potentially embarrassing. Um, but I, I was able to find, um, in trying to locate as many examples as I could, that there were a surprising number of women who joined the WCTU who had some experience um, with like alcohol and uh, in their families or alcohol related violence. And so for some of them, that was uh, a marriage that had ended because um, the their husband had a drinking problem. For others, it was like their sons or their nephews um, who struggle with alcohol. Um, but some of them dealt with like public violence that was related to activism for temperance. Um, so I found there's this one woman who was in Illinois um, named Ada Kepley, who was like particularly vocal and particularly like provoked people's ire because um, like she had a newspaper that she published and she would, if she found out that like someone was drinking or someone was spending all their wages at the saloon, she would write about it and print it in the newspaper. Um, so people didn't like that very much. You can understand why, but that, that even escalated to um, people beating her up in the street. Uh, and at some point, someone broke into her house and shot her and she survived. Um, but there was a real, like, this was not just women sitting in their parlors and writing petitions. Um, some of them were really in physical danger, both within their homes and and potentially outside their homes um, as a result of this advocacy. So the extent of that really surprised me and interested me and just is a good reminder that, you know, there it's, you can talk about the symbols and the politics and all of this, but um, at the end of the day, there's also kind of a lived, a lived experience that matters as well. Wow, that's, um, I'm sure it's very powerful to kind of do the research and just read people's stories about why they were involved in the movement. And um, yeah, that, that's fascinating. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and I really enjoyed this conversation this evening. Um, it's just a nice balance between kind of the social aspects, the social history of this movement, but also what it looked like on the legal landscape in terms of the passage of the 18th Amendment and then the repeal with the 21st Amendment. So thank you for kind of interweaving those different aspects of this topic. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for joining us this evening for this Legacies of the Constitution series. Um, we do have some upcoming events, virtual events. Um, on April 21st at 7 p.m., we have an evening with the experts series. Um, it's going to be an event featuring Jennifer Powers, who is the collections manager at Montpelier. Um, and so the evening with the experts is a series that explores recent research and work conducted by Montpelier staff. And so Jennifer is going to be talking about the work that she does in terms of caring for the collections, as well as um, the Madison House itself. So she'll be talking about her work and kind of some of the complexities of, of what she does in terms of the preservation of the objects and the building. Um, and so that is um, on the Montpelier website at montpelier.org. Again, that's April 21st 
21st at 7. So please tune in to that one um, and visit our website for more information um, about upcoming events. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And thank you to Ella for being with us to talk about the temperance movement. Thank you so much for having me. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.